some videos oh. didn't work. You pick uh, up. You picked yeah. up the Greek habits very fast, okay? Do I need, okay, <laughs> I, I don't need to do anything. Small honor for well, us. <laughs> anyway, thank you very much for invitation to this wonderful meeting. Um, I would like uh, to talk today a little <coughs> about optic neuropathies and disc swelling, and I will touch on some of the um, neuro-ophthalmic neuro emergencies that you shouldn't really miss in your patients. So what are the most common optic neuropathies? If you divide them by age, you would, in young patients, usually um, expect that the most common optic neuropathy would be optic neuritis, as demyelinating optic neuritis. And actually, you shouldn't be diagnosing <coughs> primary optic neuritis after the age of 45. Uh, after the age of 45, this is diagnosis of exclusion. Then at mid-age patients, you would uh, most often encounter non-arthritic anterior ischemic optic neuropathy. They would usually present painless vision loss without visual improvement. And in older patients, then usually after 65, it may happen after 50, according to the textbooks, um, the most common or the most dangerous one is arteritic ischemic optic neuropathy or temporal arteritis or Horton's disease. Now, <clears throat> if you... If you're not quite sure, you're talking uh, about, you know, atypical optic neuropathies, then, then basically you should do some more uh, elaborate workup. But just be very careful about um, clinical dynamics of expected optic neuropathies that actually you expect to improve and they did not. And then you have optic neuropathies that you didn't expect to improve and they did improve. And those are these two groups that basically you should be looking for these other possibilities, which are, it's a, it's a long list actually, that I will uh, skip uh, actually in this uh, taxative way, but I will then later on show some cases. Then also <coughs> with disc swelling, first of all, you should also exclude uh, pseudopapilledema from the true papilledema. So that can happen in patients usually with high hypermetropes or high myopes also in, in some cases, that they would have some funny visual field effects. But um, certainly what you uh, need to do is just to look for the cases of uh, dynamics of the disease and disease activity, usually as hyperemia or hemorrhages, um, uh, or disappearing vessels, which do not usually um, appear on the pseudopapilledema. Then <clears throat> be careful about asking patients whether or not the visual field effect is something which is dark or something which is actually just missing. Uh, it's like a blind spot. So um, do this, dissociate this. You, you can do this with Amsler very nicely. <clears throat> they will tell you it's a black spot. That will uh, tell you that's a macular problem or uh, optic uh, media problem. But if it's just something missing, then it's usually uh, uh, optic nerve or higher. Now, <clears throat> color vision testing should be part of the every workup. That is something that uh, all the uh, patients know should actually include because it's very important, because not because of congenital defects, but <clears throat> usually because that is a sensitive indicator of initial affection of optic nerve uh, conduction. <clears throat> so that's something that you should always do. And if you don't go straight to visual fields, then you do, um, then you do uh, visual field testing with uh, orientational one, and you can do it in two ways, or to, 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 to show the patient finger and ask him for the sum. Um, or going from periphery. <coughs> that's sometimes, <coughs> sorry, that's sometimes quite, quite useful because some patients may actually present to you with some, you know, funny ideas that have, their vision is down and something like that. And then you can actually use it also as a, as a quick test if some patient claims that he doesn't see anything on that eye. Or, uh, so you, you show the fingers and you ask him, you know, how many fingers do you see now? And it says, 
four. How, well, sorry, <laughs> so I don't see anything. And how many do you see now? Nothing. How many you see now? Uh, nothing. How many you see now? Nothing. How many you see now? Nothing. 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 You stop saying now, you know, and they, they go on like, no, nothing. I don't say anything. <laughs> so, so it's an issue. <clears throat> it can happen <clears throat> sometimes. So, relative from pupil defect testing is quite important. Um, <clears throat> don't forget to do that. You can do it on a slit lamp. I, I didn't show the video on that. Um, <clears throat> so to go on typical optic neuritis, <clears throat> I will not talk much about it. As you know, it is most common. It's in young women. It's in 20% first presentation of multiple sclerosis. It's papillitis, usually presenting in 20 to 50% of cases. Usually positive relative afferent pupillary defect, dyschromatopsia, central scotoma, and usually good recovery. Now, if you see <coughs> optic neuritis with macular star, this is neuroretinitis, which is not demilitating disease. It's usually a <coughs> disease that is infectious. And uh, look for Bartonella scans and uh, sometimes Borrelia uh, or Lyme disease scans. And then if you have cases like this, which are rather atypical, you need some proper workup. This is a, a 37 years old female with two months uh, history of simultaneous loss of vision in both eyes, simultaneously with negative pupillary relative defect, which it might be actually symmetrical and vision acuity, visual acuity 0.1 and uh, color vision 1 over 11 with normal fundi and normal fields. So would you believe this patient that actually that's something wrong? Then you do uh, static perimetry. So Goldman is not good for the central scotoma. And you see that only in 10 degrees, so in macular program, you start to see some central scotoma. And then you Actually, I tend, you tend to believe more to the patient, but you're still not sure, you know, it's small scotoma. Uh, would this cause such a profound visual loss of 0.1? So then you need electrophysiology, and electrophysiology tells you that macular function is normal, as multifocal EIG shows this uh, normal peak here, whilst the pattern EIG has lost N95 wave, and the VEPs are grossly prolonged and delayed. So now you believe the patient. It's bilateral optic neuritis that actually is very rare in adults. It's quite common in children. And it's associated, it can be associated with um, demyelinating lesions. Now, if you have um, a case of painless visual field loss or vision loss uh, in a, in a young, usually young adults, usually male, um, then you should think about another disease here. So this one actually uh, presented with five weeks of worsening central vision in right eye and one week in the left eye and he was treated with steroids in outside hospital and actually his visual acuity went down to 0.1 and uh, left one only to hand movements. MRI was normal. Fundus did show hyperemic discs, which you could also see in optic neuritis. Uh, MRI was normal and steroids did not help him. So what you see here is first eye that presented already has some atrophy. And this one actually with uh, acute hyperemia of the disc. But these discs don't leak in fluorescence and they show these telangiectatic vessels, which is the typical presentation of labus hereditary optic neuropathy. And electrophysiology showed, again, loss of N95 in early stages in pattern EIG, and VEP was reduced and delayed. Now, this gentleman said, OK, I told him, probably it's labus. And he said, well, doctor, you don't know what's wrong with me. He was a very defiant patient. And I said, look, I can't argue with you. We'll do genetic testing, actually. And we did genetic testing on the tree typical mutations, which, which came all negative. So we did uh, additional uh, mitochondrial genome sequencing and actually found a new mutation that affected uh, this patient. And interestingly, a couple of months after that, his cousin, who was younger than, that, uh, than him, actually appeared with the same clinical picture and the same mutation. Actually, you see this uh, 
delayed uh, uh, VEP. And actually, these were the patients that were published in the series of Slovenian labor patients. Two of them actually may improve. Uh, some of them actually improve uh, in a spontaneous way. And some of them actually do show some, uh, you know, some improvement of the electrophysiological signals. But you see how you know, the visual fields actually can improve also in these patients, which uh, otherwise you would not expect that they would improve. That sometimes takes quite a lot of time. Now, if we go now to ischemic optic neuropathies, um, what you typically see is this disc swelling, which usually will have some um, splinter hemorrhages around the disc, and they would usually have some uh, soft exudates, so cotton wool spots, and they would be poorly demarcated. Now, is it arteritic and non-arteritic? You can't say by the um, presentation. So, age helps, of course, and if it's over 65, you should consider every anterior ischemic optic neuropathy arteritic until prov proven otherwise. Um, if they are between 55, 65, which is the peak age of the non-arteritic, they would and have, um, and they have the risk factors for the cardiovascular disease that that would usually tell you that it's probably non-arteritic. But you should always be open to to suspicion in some patients. Will arteritic are usually quite pale or very pale, uh, but it's really no way to tell. If you do fluorescent, you will see this dark disc, so it's disc ischemia. Sometimes you will see delayed filling of the choroid. And sometimes you will see this cilioretinal artery occlusion. If it's isolated cilio artery occlusion in an older patient than 55 usually, this is temporal arthritis until proven otherwise. You can also see um, central artery occlusion in, arthritis temp uh, in temporal arthritis. So, so don't rule them out as embolic. So this is something you should always think that it's possible that it's also arteritic. And you can have both systems affected, so central artery and posterior ciliary arteries. And in one patient, actually, it was interesting that one actually eye was affected with ciliary artery occlusions and uh, the other one with the central artery occlusion in the same patient. And if you see multiple cotton wool spots, that, that actually tells you that it's, it's a retinal ischemia and you should suspect temporal arthritis. But you may have cases that will surprise you and this one actually is this, this kind of case. And uh, this lady was 84. And she uh, told us that she actually lost vision on the left eye quite suddenly. And she told us that she had one month of new headache with six months history of fatigue and anorexia. And she also told us that she had um, few intermittent losses of vision, that vision came back after that. So, so sort of amaurosis fujax, whatever you, you know, want to call it. Um, and when you look at her fundi, it's really not much to see. It's 84 years old fundus, uh, not in, nothing really there. So it, if she didn't have this really extensively positive relative afferent pupillary defect, you couldn't really tell from the appearance of the optic nerves or, um, or retina that actually she has any visual problems. And uh, interestingly, if you, when we did... Uh, visual fields in Goldman, there was very, very slight central scotoma only visible there. So what would you think? Uh, is it possible to be temporal arthritis? So we did biopsy and uh, she was positive. So her presentation was with posterior ischemic optic neuropathy. So this is when you have occlusion of the posterior part of the nerve, then Swelling doesn't come to the optic nerve head, so you don't see any swelling, but you see positive relative afferent pupillary defect, and, and this is something you should always keep in mind in patients that otherwise give you the suspicion. You can also do today ultrasound of temporal arteries, which is almost as um, selective and specific as uh, biopsy, but biopsy is still a gold standard. 
So we've seen actually both false negatives. We've seen false negative in a biopsy. If you do, a, if you if you biopsy and see a skip lesion, and you get a skip lesion, you can have a false negative biopsy. But we've also seen uh, false negative ultrasounds, but this is really rare. Now for the visual field effects, uh, this is a paper that we published a couple of years ago. So if you have anterior ischemic optic neuropathy, you will usually have altitudinal defect. Now if you have posterior one, you will usually just have a central scotoma. So central scotoma in all the patients with normal fundi is, is typical actually for the temporal arthritis with posterior uh, ischemic optic neuropathy presentation. And beware of the older patients that tell you that they have some diplopia that may come and go away. Um, you see that left eye actually in abduction is slightly, is slightly less, is slightly less abducted as it should be. So this lady actually has some diplopia due to ischemia of one of the either nerves or muscles that turn the eye. So, so you can have diplopia without vision loss as a presenting sign. So this is something you should remember. And always <clears throat> do a color vision testing when the patients present, because then you will know, especially if you have one eye still normal, when the second eye will start to go, then color vision goes first. So if you had normal color vision on the presentation, you're not sure if the second eye is affected. After a week or two, color vision will tell you that. So these are the three. And then don't forget in diabetic patients that they may be older patients. They, have, um, they may even have normal uh, sugar and, and well-controlled diabetes, but they can actually have... Uh, a disc swelling, which looks like sometimes ischemic optic neuropathy. There would be more hyperemia, usually in hemorrhages, around the disc. And uh, this would usually um, improve spontaneously. Um, now, if you have optic neuritis that didn't improve, and you have, uh, on the other hand, non arthritic that improved, there's another <coughs> options, actually, you should, you should test, and this is a little bit more new and advanced. So one is optic neuritis associated with antimyelin oligodendrocyte glycoprotein, and the second one with uh, anti-aquaporin-4 causing Devix disease or neuromyelitis optica. And there's another one now which appears as uh, optic neuropathy of some sort of autoimmune uh, origin of SO, anti SOX uh, antibodies. And you should never forget about neurosarcoidosis. So, um, anti MOG uh, associated optic neuritis is a spectrum of diseases, and it's uh, something that, that will affect myelin, whilst uh, anti uh, aquaporin 4 antibodies will affect more. Uh, Axons. So aquaporin-4 will actually be more aggressively affecting the, the optic nerve. <coughs> there will be some differences about them, but it's, it's also quite a lot of overlap. So this is a, one case of 19 years old female that she got gradual painless loss of visual acuity on the left day on the left eye four days prior to the hospitalization, and actually. After his, her first attack, her vision remained low despite uh, aggressive treatment. And second attack appeared also, uh, which affected her um, leg and posture. So all these tests were performed, and brain MRI is normal, because in NMO, usually you have brain MRI, which is normal. You should do spine uh, MRI, which usually shows uh, the lesions. So, so actually, she was managed with uh, <coughs> aggressive treatment, but actually she didn't really uh, improve very well. So her vision remained low, 0 0.1, 0 0.3, and uh, she had a couple of recurrences. Um, now this is another, because in the interest of time, I'll go a bit quicker. Um, this is another case which is very interesting because this was 48 years old gentleman. I told you 45 years is sort of a, let's say, 
a boundary between, let's say, it's optic neuritis or not. And <clears throat> actually, he had pain on movement. Uh, he had 0.2 vision on one eye, and, uh, and also uh, color vision was down, and the RPD was positive. So left eye showed swelling and no hemorrhages. And when you see this optic, uh, sorry, uh, visual field defect, you see it's altitudinal, and it's 48. So what would be a diagnosis in 48 or old gentlemen? Usually would be non-arteritic ischemic optic neuropathy. However, he had pain on movement, which was interesting, and uh, he also had diffuse edema with no radial hemorrhages, which you should usually see, and he had this gradual onset, so we decided to treat him anyway, <clears throat> and all of a sudden, actually, his visual acuity went back to normal. And um, pain actually subsided as well. He, he improved really very well, and uh, actually, he was shown to have anti-MOG antibodies and his um, actually visual acuity went to normal and also his fields went to normal. So this is a treatable disease, so don't forget about this. So anti-MOG and NMO antibodies will affect retina, uh, or sorry, optic nerve, more in NMO than MOG, anti-MOG. So just to, just to go quickly over compressive optic neuropathies, <coughs> so one, Presentation of papill edema, uh, which shows normal MRI, is idiopathic intracranial hypertension. It would usually present in rather obese ladies, and uh, they would have concentric visual loss and headaches. And they can actually progress. And if they do progress and they don't respond to diamox of high uh, dosages, then you should consider shunt. Then. You may have this kind of cases in, in young patients. So this one was detained in prison, so that prison you know, officers didn't really take him very seriously. So he had some gait problems and some headaches, visual acuity point down, point 0.6, visual field a little bit nonspecific. But when you see these discs, you see that that has been there for some time. So it's a chronic papilledema that's been there at least for six months or more. An MRI showed large tumor of cerebellum. So it can go slowly and it can only affect vision. And uh, this one actually was even more tragic. So it was 54 years old, normal gentleman coming to, <clears throat> to us with some uh, complaints of non specific visual field loss. Vision was 0.6 in a poor eye, normally in a one eye, slightly blurred disc margins on a right eye. But what you see here is homonymous hemianopia of incongruous type. And if you see this, this points to the tractus, and tractus is always associated with <coughs> the big vessels. So if you see this type of visual field effect, think about <coughs> aneurysm and do imaging immediately. So he had four silent aneurysms. And while he was waiting for operation, he bled spontaneously and died. So just to remind you to another uh, emergency, uh, this is a third nerve palsy with pupil involving third nerve palsy. Don't ever forget this. If you see this kind of presentation, um, you should suspect that there's an aneurysm of posterior uh, communicating artery compressing uh, third nerve, and you should actually uh, send your patient to the um, hospital immediately. So this is why this compress uh, the third nerve, because um, pupillary fibers are superficial on the third nerve, and if it's uh, aneurysm starting to compress, the pupil will dilate. If you have diabetic patients, which are younger ones, then you will have an ischemic problem, but the center of the nerve will be affected, so we'll have all other signs of the nerve palsy, but the pupil will be perfect, so think about that. Then <clears throat> you may see six nerve palsy, usually associated with tumors in epipharynx pressing from below, <clears throat> and if you don't see motility problem in terms of double vision, uh, and you see pupillary um, uh, differences more than one millimeter, or let's say 0 0.7, 0 0.8, and slight doses, you should think about, what is this? It's easy, Horner's syndrome. This one actually, if you <coughs> look carefully, has a bit lighter uh, 
coloration of the iris, so that that is a congenital type of horners. So if you give them, give them cocaine, they will dilate. Both the pupils will dilate to some extent because some fibers usually will be uh, preserved, but normal pupil will dilate fully, while this one will only dilate slightly. So to conclude, you should think about unusual optic neuropathies always when you see unexpected improvement, when you don't expect it, or vice versa. If you don't see expected improvement in optic neuritis in a couple of weeks, then you should think about long <coughs> Um, you should think about um, atypical or, you know, you should exclude other causes. list is really very long, but think about also inflammatory optic neuropathies because they are treatable, so anti-mog, uh, aquaporin-4, so the Vicks disease, uh, neuromyelitis optica, sarcoid, very important, and GCA, of course, and other autoimmune disease, and, and don't forget incongruous homonymous hemiopia as a presenting sign is really something that you should not forget. And don't say it's optic neuritis right away if they have the patient is more than 45. So if it's uniocular presentation, it may be also something else. It may be a tumor, it may be, it may be aneurysm. So I already said that. And in elderly patients with visual loss, think temporal arthritis until proven otherwise. Vision loss may be the only presentation of intracranial hypertension, as you see, and uh, beware of the nepose and Horner syndrome. So I'd like to thank you for your invitation and kind attention. This is one of the, one of the cats that we had in a little you know, island in Adriatic, and these cats usually come to, you know, to us when we are there. And, uh, this is a beautiful presentation of a probably post-traumatic Horner syndrome because this cat probably was caught by a dog at some point and actually caused this Horner syndrome. Thank you very much. Thank you, thank you, thank you very much, Professor Paulina, for being on time and for summarizing half of neuroophthalmology, just 20 minutes. Uh, is there any question? Maybe from Christian yes. Kiewer? Dr. Kukula. Uh, I'd like to ask you concerning the two boys with uh, uh, the Bernard degenerative neuropathy. Yes. Uh, are you treated? I mean, with uh, IBM? Yes. Uh, <coughs> now, yes now, we, now we do treat every patient uh, newly presenting. We did a Benon. But uh, those two that I showed was before the times of Ida Benon. So you may have this spontaneous improvement in some patients. Um, and sometimes, basically, it can take quite, quite long until they start improving. And we had one that, that started improving only after four years, for example. So spontaneous improvement is not impossible. So you should basically, you can, you can say this to patients. Well, that's, that's not quite well uh, understood yet, and uh, indications are changing, but however, at the moment, indications should be that, that you treat the patients that are under five years of history uh, of the presentation, and then you treat them pretty much all, all, all their life, really. Um, you don't stop, because their side effects are really not significant. But now there are some studies that showed a study in Austria, which we are not sure whether it's really um, substantiated. But uh, there was a case series that started it happened on even after 30 years of presentation and showed some improvement. So we don't, we don't really know about that, yes. One last question. How often do you have a uh, Yeah. Yeah. Well, VEP will, will tell you if they start improving, uh, VEP will, will be the only test, actually, that will, will show that. Um, we tried also pattern ERG, we tried full field ERGs, that you showed no difference, but VEP is reduced in latency, and, and some VEPs actually might be uh, actually having better 
uh, or higher amplitudes, but really what it shows is visual fields, and um, usually visual fields in the central part. Uh, you, you can't do it with Goldman, you should do it with, with octopus or other static perimetry. Usually we'll see very little island of vision through which they can see. So it's, it's quite interesting. You do fields and you don't see much of improvement, but then, then if you're careful, you see that little islands and then they expand over and, and time and they, they actually can get quite, uh, quite good improvement. So you use both tests? Yeah, well, we, we, we objectivize it by VP usually, although you could only do visual fields, yes. Okay. Thank you. I saw it, my, yes, okay. Thank you very much for this uh, excellent presentation. There is a microphone. Like you said, we do know that uh, apart from the uh, visual acuity reduction, uh, the RAPD, the field effect, and the color deficiency, which are characteristic signs of the, of the optic neuropathy, mm -hmm. we do get um, uh, problems with the contrast sensitivity. So I just wanted to ask you, uh, what, what do you usually do in your practice? Do you ever check that? Is there any indication uh, to check the contrast sensitivity as well? What do you think? In uh, ONTT study, that was... Uh, that's optic neuritis treatment trial study. Contrast sensitivity actually was the most sensitive uh, indicator of whatever improvement or, or deterioration. However, for some reason, we are not quite sure that this tells us a lot because we are, we are because contrast sensitivity is a more photopic uh, way of testing. So this is pretty much um, done by visual acuity and then color vision is something we are really relying on. Um, so we are not quite sure that contrast sensitivity will be something that makes you, you know, change your decision. And for example, as I mentioned, in, in temporal arteritis, this is really important. So, because usually there will be one eye that gone, that's gone. And you can't do much about that eye already. And sometimes they improve, but that's not very, very common. But if you then, at the presentation of first eye, record normal color vision, and then you treat them, because you know you have to treat them over years sometimes, um, and you never know where you are with your dosage of the, of the steroids, what will you see if they start deteriorating? Color vision will go first, and then visual acuity. So if, if you are at the presentation 11 over 11, or 15 over 15, whatever you do, and then they come back and they are five over 11, and they complain about some symptoms, Yes, that's the way to, 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 to be very, you know, really careful and start treating. So, moving on to the next presentation, also by...